Uh, thanks for coming along uh, late on the afternoon at the end of ground. So I hope you're not too tired after a, a long couple of days. Um, uh, I'm here, I'm going to talk about functional fertility in grass-fed cattle. Um, a little bit about um, what I do. I'm a professional ecologist and family farmer. We've been on our farm for about 100 years, family farm. Um, and um, during that journey of sort of doing ecological grazing and managing nature reserves and doing that sort of thing, and I was farming as well, getting paid to graze nature reserves, but actually the grazing of the cattle themselves wasn't making any money and um, and so it was really just when I found holistic management that that changed that and that's kind of the whole picture behind everything we do is holistic management and so anything I'm talking about you know a lot of the decision making we've gone through has come from that process um, since then we sort of built up to about 150 uh, pedigree Angus and one of the reasons we sort of focused on the pedigree side was that Early on, I was very lucky to be quite early on in the regenerative grazing space and did a bit of consultancy and stuff and saw some big estates transitioning with some very big hungry cattle and looking at those systems and looking at those cattle, those systems sort of fall over and the cattle really struggle and some of these big flag flagship estates, you know, neighbours were looking in and they were seeing what was going on and for me, someone really passionate about seeing change into an ecolog ecological agricultural system um, it was sort of seemed a really high risk thing that if we didn't get the cattle genetics right, then this thi these things c might not work. And so that was a real motivating factor for us. And I think if you think about an arable farm, if you were to say that, uh, you know, it didn't matter what variety the arable farmer used for his wheat crop, you know, they wouldn't, you know, they, they wouldn't take that. And I think we've also got to think about not just our grass genetics, but we've got to think about our cattle genetics as well. Um, so we run about, we'll have about 150 pedigree Aberdeen Angus to the bull uh, this summer. Um, and, you know, and that's build, been built up over the last 10 years, starting from about 40 acres at home up to about 1,000 acres that we farm across now. A lot of that's hill land, scrub land. So in terms of stocking rates and stuff, that's not, uh, you know, exactly as you can't really look at it like that. Some of the land will be three quarters scrub, um, but it puts a great challenge on the animals. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So we think about what, what do we want from a cow? And I think, you know, quite often when we're looking at this sort of stuff in isolation, we'll talk about uh, and think about, you know, oh, what does the cow need? Do I need to treat it for this? There's this problem, we need to do that. Uh, this is reared up, we've got to look at something else. But actually, we rather than thinking about what we've got to do for the cow, we've got to be thinking what the cow should do for us. If we're treating it, if that's cost, that's time, it's labor. And, you know, we're in a, a suckler business is a, is a low margin business. So it's important that we get that right. So we want really to have quite simply a marketable calf every year on time, problem free. And that's kind of the presentation in a nutshell. So you can, you can, you know, turn around, go home if you like. But that's, that's it in a nutshell. That's what you want. Now, you can have that with a lot, with a lot of inputs, with a lot of support for that cow. Or you can have it in a really low input system. And we'll have a look at that. And it, that depends on your goals and your context and what you want to achieve with your breeding. And, uh, you know, if you want to be doing show cattle and you want to be feeding cattle, that's fine. But just understand there's a cost to that and that's going to have an impact on your bottom line. And, you know, some people look at different things. And so the pedigree world and it's like Charolais and the top growth breeds, you, they might only be having a calf every 18 months. And you think about the long term cost of that on the system. Some, some of those really high muscle breeds might be having C-sections electively every single carving for three or four carvings if we can get that much out of them. And so you've got to be thinking about the, you know, how that looks and the optics for agriculture generally and you know, our responsibility to the animals. You know, it's probably never been imp more important for us to be telling good news stories about how we manage livestock these days as well. So you've got to be thinking about that too, I think. Um, you, know, uh, you know, in terms of like foot trimming, all the little things that people do, that if you can eliminate all these jobs, take the stress off the cow as well for all these times you intervene as well. So you really want them doing their own thing. So we talked a little about what your context is, what your goals are. And looking around now, look sort of rather cheekily, you can see there's an awful lot of kit here. There's all the people for all the farmers here who want to sell, sell things to the farmers. And so you've just got to be careful about where you spend your dollars and where you get them from as well. So your solar dollars are what comes essentially from sunshine and rain that grows your grass. And if you can have a productive system, profitable system just from that without the inputs, 
and you know without having to have too many visits from the reps who want to sell you everything then your business is probably going to be more resilient and it's, pr it's probably going to be more profitable so that's really what we're looking at is maximum sustainable profit not production um, that we can get from what the environment can provide so if we have animals that need more than the, uh, the environment can provide then we're going to have to provide more and that's always going to come um, with a cost so if we look at the whole that we have under management, that might be a, all of our resources, our staff, everything else, all the energy that comes from the people, but also the main part of that is the environment that we're managing and the amount of energy that that environment can produce each year. And obviously, by definition, that's limited. Um, we can increase that available environment over time through good management, but there's still a limit. And then we have to think about a lot of people talk about grass management and maximizing that and being as efficient as you can. But you've also got to think about the risks of pushing your production levels right up to rely on really perfect, excellent management all the time. Because what happens if you get some really bad seasonal weather, climate change, whatever else is causing problems with production, we have long drought periods. So if your production level in your cows is at that high level that requires that high, high management, then you know, potentially you could have a problem if that environment isn't available for them in the long term. So you really want to think about that. And that's something we think about with our wi when we're developing our bulls as well, because we don't, you know, we don't necessarily mo you know, move them perfectly and try and make sure they're always full and growing perfectly. Because when we sell on to customers, we don't know exactly how they're going to be managed. They're going to be managed perfectly there too. I'd much rather have them have a harder time at my place so that wherever they go, they're going to do well, they're going to gain weight, they're going to perform. And so just thinking about that in terms of what commercial systems are doing as well, I think it's an important consideration. I think the, uh, the other thing is when we look at a lot of the science and the development of um, sort of production metrics around cattle, um, if you believe the, f the, the hype and what you might read in some of the promotional stuff is that we can keep increasing production all the time. You have these things called estimated breeding values for the cattle and they go up every year. So it's all the time, it's the higher number, it's the higher number all the time. But we don't have an ever increasing available amount of energy from the environment. And so we've really got to make sure we're not trying to do things that sort of, you know, trying to make energy out of nothing to make the cows grow because that's something we can't do. Um, it uh, might be a bit over the top, just to, <laughs> to quote the first two laws of thermodynamics, but just to put a point on it, that the, the, the reality is we can take energy, say, in grass, we can transform it into another form, but we can't just create it out of nothing and we can't destroy it. And then the second law is the fact that the process of change also means that you're losing energy or energy is being used in that process as well. And so not only is the amount of energy limited, but in the process of conversion, we're always going to be losing energy. And so we can't actually just make something out of nothing. We can't break the laws of physics and say we can have ever-increasing levels of production. And uh, hopefully that means that we can then sort of take a bit of a mindset change around these production levels and aim for optimum production, optimum production on the land, but also optimum production in the cattle, and take that forward in terms of what we're doing with the breeding. <coughs> um, I'll skip over some of that. The key thing is that we've got when we're thinking about that, that limited environment is that if we're going to have animals that need more than that, then we're going to have to provide the extra environment in a bag, in feed, providing crutches and all sorts of stuff. I'll talk a little bit about le later. But we don't worm our cattle routinely. Um, we only get native grasses. We don't use reseeds. We don't use forage crops. Everything is cheap, fairly low quality forage. And we want animals that can take that forage, convert it, and, and produce a calf every year, a marketable calf every year. And I think in terms of having uh, animals that can cope with these systems, that means inevitably we're probably going to have a smaller, slightly less productive animal, slightly less productive cow. Um, and it, but it also means we can keep our costs as low as possible. And that means in a, in a situation at the moment where these costs are ever going up, we've got inflationary pressures all over the place. But the thing is, if, if we don't actually have those costs in the first place, then those costs are not going up for us. But if that inflationary pressure is also going up for the consumer, as in the price, is a price of meat and therefore the price we get for our cattle is going up, if we've got those low costs pegged down, that means our margins are going up. If you're in a low input, a higher input system, you might be getting a higher price, but costs are, are following that up as well and your margin isn't changing and probably with the costs 
going up quicker than price, your margin could be going down, even though you're getting more per animal. So <coughs> the key thing, again, cows that work for us and not the other way around. So uh, many of our cows have never been in a shed. They're out wintered all year. Um, you know, they don't get dry bedding bedded down all the time, all that lovely conserved forage. We make hay, the hay stays outside. We roll the hay out as we reach it, as we go around the grazing platform through the year. Uh, you know, and I think those cold days, if you think about what an animal can actually stand, a lot of people say, oh, is it a bit cruel to keep them out all the time? You know, a friend of mine in Canada, he's running cattle at minus 40 um, in through right through the winter. And there, you know, he's got incredible fertility rates and, and working really well. So I think in our environment, we sometimes think about we're in a harsh environment. We're probably in about one of the best places you could hope to raise cattle anywhere in the world. So we need to sort of take that excuse away from ourselves. But also remember what the animals need in terms of maybe a dry bed. If you're moving them regularly, they've got clean area to lie in and, and you know, and, and probably sideways rain at one or two degrees probably doesn't feel much different to that dry minus 40 in the middle of Canada. So just have a think about all of that stuff. Here's some, a picture of some of our wintering cows just after weaning. I think there's about, I think there's 87 in that group that was wintering one year. So we just have these areas of bales which during really wet weather, snow, or right at the end of the grazing season, we'll just hold them up here just to let the grass get ahead of us in the grazing, se uh, you know, in the growing season as we come through. But they're wintered out all the time, and they'll have that ad lib at the end of the year, and they and they do pretty well on the rough hay. Rolling bales out as well, um, right through the winter. So we'll roll bales about we'll roll about about uh, one bale per twenty head. Um, in it as we go through the mobs, so we can be rolling up to four bales a day, depending on the size of the mobs we have. And I think the key thing there, just in terms of management on that, is you know rolling out the bales so that everything gets a place to feed, so there's not too much competition for the animals. A little bit's not too bad, but a bit more pressure on them. Um, and then a great quote there. I you know I used to talk about hardy animals. And then uh, that quote there is sort of really stuck with me from Alan Savory. There's no such thing as a hardy animal. And I think the key thing here is to think about the fact that actually we want animals that fit that environment. And so if we've got a limited environment out there that's growing a certain amount of biomass, we need animals that absolutely fit to that environment, not ones that need more, not, you know, not ones that are going over fat that there's too much energy for them. We actually just need optimum environmental fit. And that's yeah, something we understand about evolutionary fitness and about that con continuing on. And the other thing to think about is a lot of what we talk about with animals and, pr and production of the individuals, the highest performing bull, the highest figures on a female, whatever that is, we're looking at the individuals. We want to think about the herd as a whole and how that whole herd adapts to the environment from year to year and how that's changing. And that's because the environment has an awful lot of uh, impact on what how that animal changes and it has to adapt to all of these different things this is uh, Jan Bonsma's wheel of, of the environmental impacts that have that have an impact on physiology of the cow and so all of these things are Im impacting it all the time and if we don't uh, take account of that and if it's not fit to e all of those different environmental factors then we could have a problem with the animal and if you think about all of these things that are potentially changing, having a change on the cow and, ad and adaptive mechanisms within the cow are starting and changing. You know, it, and then we start adding four, five, six, seven traits that we're gonna start selecting for on top of the environmental adaption that's going on. You can see how that could be a challenge. And so how do we achieve that adaptation to the environment? Um, you can see, look through any of the breed magazines and the promotion things, and it kind of seems like it's all about the bull. We, we, you know, the bull is half your herd. I remember, you know, being told that by my father and grandfather who used to breed Herefords. Um, but in terms of what the bull actually does, you know, it's not, you know, the cow has actually got to carry a calf while, while raising a calf all the way through the winter. And it's got to give birth. It's got to do it all again on time, uh, calf correctly. The bull's kind of hanging out most of the year. It's probably has 60 days to work during the year having a wonderful time, and then he gets a rest. So in terms of what he does, he maybe has some structural Im impact. You know, maybe he's got to fight some other males. So he's got to have good uh, locomotion and, you know, doesn't get injured too much. And, you know, he's got good legs and feet, and that tends to carry through. But the cow's doing an awful lot more for us, but we're focusing on the male. So probably, you know, it's a comment of that society there maybe a little bit as well. So why didn't we focus on the fe feminine? It's interesting. I used to work um, for the Rare Breeds Survival Trust. 
and talked to some of the top cattle geneticists and livestock geneticists there and they would talk about you know, you've got the sort of uh, Mendel's law of segregation where you know, you've got these 23 pairs of chromosomes and those all split and you get 50% from the male 50% from the female we all know this is true don't we and so if you've got a bull running over 30 cows then potentially that bull's going to have much more impact on the whole herd because it's, it's half your herd, that one animal. So we put focus onto the male for that reason. And so because of this, cattle geneticists and the scientists told us that these old herdsmen who always seemed to think that there was something in cow families, you know, they'd know that that sort of that flora cow family or whatever, we've got cherry blossom cow family. And they'd say, well, that cow family, always her daughters always seem to work. And we sort of they sort of trusted in the cow families that worked for them, and they ne you know they never go away from them. But we were told that was nonsense. That that didn't matter. It was about using the bull to keep improving through your estimated breeding values all the time. And but then we think about not just the genetic improvement from what we can bring in from another animal, but also the epigenetic improvement. And epigenetics, the definition of that is changing. Changes to an organism caused by modification of gene expression rather than the actual alteration of the genetic code. So we've got all these genes in our DNA, and it's rather some of them are switched on, some of them are switched off. The environmental pressures that we saw in that wheel of all the different environmental factors are switching on and off those genes depending on which environmental pressures they're taking. So if you think about us taking a cow out of its environment, putting it in a shed, it's not actually getting that environmental signal in order for those changes to happen. So we have to think about how that, you know, the power of that in an animal. If you think about just in the purest form of epigenetics within ourselves, is when, you know, when a when that first uh, cell gets uh, get fer the egg gets fertilized, and you get a few collection of a few cells, the blastocyst, which then each of those cells are identical but then they'll each keep dividing and some of those cells might become part of an eyeball, they might be become part of your big toe, uh, could be part of an artery. They're going to look completely different uh, even though they've got exactly the same genetic code and that's because the switches within the gene itself are getting switched on and off because of environmental signals. So we can change things quite a lot. We've got alcohol adaptation on, on here, which is uh, probably quite apt for the last few days here at Groundswell. But it's quite a useful thing is that actually what happens if you drink alcohol over an extended period of time, it'll switch on, switch off genes that actually change the enzymes that are produced in the liver and help you to break down more alcohol more quickly so you can deal with that situation. So thank you very much for that. Um, but it's not just that environmental adaptation um, within the life, but also through generations and within life we've noticed as well we took on some red pole cattle that had never been out winter they were actually housed for six seven months of the year and they they were really thin hided and i thought so these cattle are never going to manage but what happened over time was you know what S quite a few of those cattle didn't manage and they couldn't manage being wintered out but many of them actually got thicker and thicker hides over the course of two or three seasons generations and now they're actually really starting to thrive in that system through within life changes. You can see the change in the rumen size on the uh, these, these animals as well because then now they've got a more of a forage based diet. So there's actual changes to the animals within life from environmental adaption too that we've got to think about. And, and how we actually code for that environmental adaptation too is really important. And the role of mitochondria in that. And I, I will just say that the reason I sort of try and look into like the science behind a lot of this is because so much of the sort of the numbers in cattle, the estimated breeding values, how's this, you know, we've got an algorithm that shows this is going to grow this much, this is going to perform like that, and it's sold as science. But if we actually look at how things work, I think it allows us to challenge it a bit more, make it, make it a bit more simple and see that these regenerative systems can work. So the, the mitochondria are really important because they take uh, the proteins and enzymes and they turn that into ATP for cellular energy. So that's how the actual all of our cells actually function. That, that, that's uh, so our metabolism, they're managing all of that. They're looking at cell death in relation to environmental factors. So, you know, if something gets stressed, toxins, poisons, that sort of thing, cell renewal. Production of steroid hormones and, and uh, sex hormones as well, which is obviously very important for fertility. Um, a regulation of immunity, um, amino acid breakdown of food, 
Um, and they grow and repair body tissue, which is really, really important as well. So really important factors that they, that they look after. Uh, everything to do with that energy regulation, which is actually their relationship to the environment, the amount of energy in the environment. And they actually have a higher le rate of genetic mutation as well in the DNA within mitochondria, which allows them to adapt to change quicker. But here's the thing. We talked earlier about the 50% of the DNA coming from the male, 50% from the female, but 99% of all mitochondrial DNA comes from the female. So suddenly, we look at actually that feminine line, and it makes sense when you think about the herd as essentially a female, a feminine thing. Like, it's that, it's that entire herd is actually, that's the thing that's interacting with the environment. And so now we suddenly realize that those cow families are, are back. And those old herds, men and women, who looked at those, an those cows and they knew which lines worked for them, they were 100% right. And the geneticists were actually not, you know, they were incorrect on this. So we should have perhaps had the spotlight on the cow all, all along. We c that's just another to come back to show all of those things that our animals are, are interacting with all the time. The other thing to say is that we, do, we must actually put challenges and pressures on our animals as well, because all of us are anti-fragile beings in that we need to be stressed and, and have environmental stresses upon us in order for our bodies to react to become stronger. Just in the case of you need to go to the gym to work out in order to grow muscle. You actually need to encounter bugs and you know, and, and things for our immune system to actually be stronger to deal with them. If you don't have that, then you will not be able to deal with them. If you, if you take people out of that environment and use lots of bleach and they don't encounter viruses and bacteria, then they w their immune systems won't be able to cope with that. Things like peanut allergy, things like that we've taken out of ch children's exposure and now we have more and more of it. At the more we take it away, the more problems we have. So this is, these are things that we know about. So we must make sure that we, we actually provide these things. And we don't vaccinate any of our animals, and we just cull on b performance. And over time, we find that then we don't have the losses. They can, they can manage within that environment. They're a fit to the environment and all the things they might encounter. So then you don't have the problems at all. And th these things that are crutches that we support with cost, um, but we think about actually what can a cow stand and does she need to stand something actually to be stronger? So we, you know, we're taking something away from her if we don't actually allow her to have that process. Um, and I think that's the key thing is keeping those costs down, getting those high prices that are available at the moment and then you've got a bigger margin. So coming back to that, what do we really need? We, it comes back to we need that marketable calf every year, on time, problem free. Um, we need her to be fertile, so gets in calf, hopefully first cycle if possible, certainly by second cycle. She's got to get maintain condition through the winter while in calf, calf at foot until it's 10 months old, and they'll be weaned about 10 months, so she's carrying that calf all winter. Calves correctly, pair bonds, but it's, isn't too dangerous when we're trying to tag the calves at the same time. Um, and it has that healthy martial calf in good body condition every year. And, and does that all the time. And the carving correctly thing is important as well, like if we consider that. I just dropped my water. <laughs> but is, is actually just in terms of she's got to do that in her own time and she's got to do that correctly. If you go and pull a calf too early, and again, don't allow a natural process to happen, there's a pause when that calf's coming out where actually there's a transfer of blood coming from um, the placenta that's get pumped in. You can, if you pull that calf too early, or if it's born almost too quickly, then you can actually end up not having that two pints of blood in the calf. You're going to have lethargy in the calf. So again, it's about calving correctly, not, per not, e not just easily all the time. So we have to be careful where we can go wrong. And I think that picture illustrates where perhaps we might have gone horribly wrong in some of our cattle selection. You think well, wha how this looks to the general public, and there's still a lot of this about, um, it's a real problem and, and some of this stuff that's sold as science and progress I think we have to be really careful about you know, actually calling that so you know how's it working all this technology and science that we're using in our breeding well at the moment the carving interval that I guess we'd all hope would be about 365 days the average ought to be somewhere near a year um, but it actually it's at the moment it's about 426 days the average age of first carving at the moment on the BCMS data is about 34 months. Now both of these are averages. So that means not necessarily exactly half, but more or less half are worse than these figures. And in terms of profitability, in terms of production loss, this is huge. 
So, you know, you've got to be thinking about that too. And to so and if you look in America, US uh, data shows that the weaning weight hasn't actually increased in the last 30 years, despite the numbers for growth rate and weaning weight having gone up for 30 years. The actual weaning weights across those calf crops, and that's because the environment itself can only wean a certain size of calf. There's only such so, so much energy it has to give. Suckler cow profitability is terrible at the moment across the industry, and we have to sort that out. Really important for family farms. It's really important for ecology that we have functional cows. So we have to get that right. So now we have slightly bigger cows that mean slightly bigger calves, but have much higher energy maintenance requirements than the environment can produce, so we provide it for them. So in terms of why we're selecting for growth and why we're selecting for that sort of thing, can anyone tell me here who hasn't been to see me speak before, um, why does one animal grow more than another? Can someone answer that question? Come on, I know it's late in the afternoon. but Okay, so we've got a room full of farmers. Eats more, possibly could, yeah. So on the same fitness to the environment, could be, yeah. So on the same amount of food and resources, why won't one grow more than another? Because the genetics, and what's the genetics coding for? So, so if we think, like, why does one human grow to be a basketball player at seven foot tall? And another one might be uh, Lewis Hamilton, about five foot two. You know, why do we have that difference in people for the same thing? Maybe they've eaten the same amount of food. So the key thing, why, and actually they d you might not know this, but NBA star, future stars of the NBA, before they start drug testing, they actually give them growth hormone when they're in their sort of mid to late teens to get them to keep growing. So it's actually our hormones that decide when we grow and how much we grow. So if we're selecting for growth, what are we actually, what potentially are we selecting for? We're selecting for growth hormone dominance over the reproductive hormones. And if fertility is something we need to sort out, selecting gr for growth hormone to the disadvantage of uh, reproductive hormones is probably not a good idea. What happens um, when the reproductive sex hormones overtake the growth hormones the growth plates on the long bones close, and then you get the, the secondary sexual characteristics. So in the cow, you've got that deepening hip, you've got the, uh, you know, really starts to get that cowy look, she widens, uh, the udder starts to develop, the scutcheon at the back, which is the, the folds below the vulva start to come in. So all of these things that we need for effective functional animals start to develop at that point. But if you've got growth hormone dominating all the time, and we've all had these steers that we maybe we've bought in the past that just keep growing till they're four years old. So if those growth, growth hormones are dominating all the time, we're going to lose fertility on this. So we have to be really careful about what we're selecting for, the unintended consequences. And there's loads of unintended consequences for a lot of the stuff we select for here. I was talking to a butcher uh, yesterday who's saying he's got a real problem with these bigger carcasses. Because if you want to have a nice eight ounce sirloin steak, then because you've got a huge eye muscle, and a lot of the traits we select for is how much eye muscle has it got? Well, um, well the problem is that you end up having to have a really thin steak for an eight-ounce steak, and you can't actually cook it properly. So the retailers don't want it. The processors do want that big eye muscle because of the Europe grid means they can sell it for that. But also, eye muscle area is also correlated with carving difficulty. So we're taking on a cost and a problem just to get something that actually the consumer doesn't want. So we've got to really think about these unintended consequences. You know, weaning weight, well, that, is that selecting for growth rate? Is it selecting for milk in the mother? If you're selecting for milk, more milk all the time, I want really milky cows, but hang on, how much environment have you got out there to provide the milk and for her to get in calf and for her to keep, you know, just have a think what you might be doing. Growth rate, well, maybe early growth rate's okay, and I know some people have selected for that, but then to still have early sexual maturity at sort of 10, 11, months of age so they can start bull them at 13 months. So that process happens early enough for them to get in calf. So you have to be feed efficiency. A lot of the feed efficiency tests. Interesting, a friend of mine went to visit one of these and they were they basically had as much food as ever they could have of grain. And then this was this was apparently been sold as giving them room and efficiency in a grass fed system. They're getting as much grain as they can possibly eat and we're supposed to believe that this is going to tell us something about how they're going to perform out here. I just think we have to be really careful because you are selecting for are you selecting for more bone? Are you selecting for more lean muscle? 
which is uh, potentially could also be a, a factor affected by hor hormones as well. So you, there's a lot of potential things that we could get wrong. And one of the things holistic management tells us is if we make a decision, it probably is wrong. So then we can monitor it and see what those consequences might be and make sure you know what you're aiming towards. Marbling, people talk about marbling a lot at the moment, really important, but actually our native breeds never had a problem with marbling. But we selected for all that growth rate, didn't we? It's that lean muscle mass, which is the easiest thing to do. And we've ended up with these steaks that actually taste terrible, spoiled our product in the supermarkets for the consumers that we really should be looking after. Um, and then there's a problem also with, with, with marbling, settling for a sele uh, excessive mar marbling with growth means that you know a really hormonally balanced bull will be quite high in testosterone. Now, if, you're if it's high in testosterone, it'll actually have more of a lean muscle mass than a fat muscle mass. And so, you're again, potentially s leading to hormone imbalance and then fertility issues. We know that there are also a lot of problems with having anti antagonistic traits that work in two directions. So we're aiming for growth rate, but they're also aiming for calving ease. So we want small calves, then we want them to be big. So we end up getting them early and, and you know, also selecting maybe on shorter gestation. So we get premature calves that are slow to stand, slow to suck, more management interventions, and this is causing problems for us. You know, with the calving ease story, initially the first EBV on calving ease led to much narrower calves that were really easily born. But then when they came to have a calf themselves, those heifers, they were narrow and then led to calving difficulty. So, so then we had to have ca uh, calving ease direct and then calving ease maternal as well so that we knew what their future calving would be like as well. So selective calving ease actually led to calving difficulty. And so you just really got to be think carefully how we select for stuff. But essentially nothing is free. We can't get energy for free. Everything's a trade-off. And so we've got this env limited environment, so we have to try and fit that rather than pretend we can produce energy from nothing. We've talked a little bit about this already, so I'll, I'll skip through some of this. Essentially, coming back to this, I'm going to keep repeating it, that we have to keep producing a calf every year. That's everything in terms of selection. Um, and, uh, and fertility is absolutely key to that. Um, Jan, Dr. Jan Bonds was a cattle scientist, a uh, fascinating guy. That's his book, Man Must Measure. You I think there's a, the Wortham Lectures, I think you can buy for a couple of quid on Amazon. Well worth buying that, bu buying that book. Anything from Jan Bonds, you can find that. Uh, well worth looking at. So we want to have think about how we can reduce our costs uh, and use fertility to get there. So carving... Older heifers obviously means that at three, say, we've got much higher heifer development costs. They're hanging around. And those are, those are heifers that perhaps could be, if they weren't there, there could be some cows producing calves there. So we lost income there. Um, and it, the, all the data shows that calving at 24 months increases the number of calves per cow over her lifetime. And that's shown time and time again. You know, tighter calving block as well with the increased fertility means that you've got lower labor costs. You've got less stress at, at, at that time of year, and you've got a consistently aged calf crop as well. That's just to show same animal at 11 months, uh, well, pedigree Angus, and then at 19 months when she's in calf, and you can see that development, the hormone development. She becomes what looks like a calf, heifer calf, into sort of a more cowy look as she's getting ready to come towards, she's in pregnancy towards calving. And you know, what are the extra costs? We've talked a little bit about this in terms of the, the cost of fertility and not, not focusing on that. But if you look at the business side of things, you know, 75% of calves weaned, which isn't uncommon in, in UK herds, uh, probably that's, th that's basically the bottom half. If you increase that on 100 cows, that's 20 calves. Extra 20 calves at weaning, that's an extra 6,000 kilos. Try and make that up in growth rate. And then what are the consequences of selecting for growth rate on your fertility and then your ability to actually achieve that? You just can't do it. So you've got to be careful about the unintended consequences of that. You know, and that potential extra income of, of selling them at, a, at an older age, you could be losing 20,000 a year there. Uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's not quite a wage, but it's not far away from it. So we've got busiest time of year. We don't want to have those extra costs. And then if we think about the difference as well between a calf that's born at the start, and if we've got a long calving period, it might be, say, 100 days older than the one that's born at the end. Well, that, at a kilo a day, that's 100 kilos lost 
on that calf that was born at the end. So we can have first cycle breeders, a cohort of calves that are all more or less the same age. It makes a big difference to our profitability. It also means that when we're thinking about the age at first calving, um, if you've got a split uh, of, say, three months across your calving period, then you've got a big difference between the age of those heifers at the first time they're bulling and also the age they have when at the first time they're calving. And so that can cause you problems. So having that cohort of calves that are all the same age is, makes a massive difference in terms of moving forward in fertility and making sure you get everything together. And in terms of what nature does at that, we should also think about mature size. So we aim for growth in these bigger cows and cull cow prices are right uh, are high at the moment. A lot of people talk about, or oh, you get a lot, you know, I got two grand for a big cow the other day, someone told me. And it's like, okay, well that's fine, but you've got to remember then your age at first calving is going to be harder because your mature size has an impact at what age they can have, they can carve. And in nature, Mature size, adult size, is a massive predictor, as you can see from all of those things there, the, from the elephant that doesn't start having babies until they're 14 to 17, and right down to the common vole, uh, the smallest animal there on the list there at just a couple of months. And so that is entirely related. So we've just got to think about cow size in relation to that. Okay, so when we start thinking about the importance of fertility, so we've looked at what fertility is, the financial impact of not having fertile animals, and and so we something we want to select for. But what is it? So is it something we can have inherently fertile animals? And I think this is where you've got to come back to um, when we talk about environment fit to the environment. Is is actually uh, what I think you could. I'll let I'll let you read that on the screen. I'm not going to read it out. But essentially. Everything is adaptive to the environment, and I think that's hardwired. A lot of the research shows that fertility is most linked to body condition, which suggests that the animal's performance within the environment is the thing that is, has the biggest impact. So if there isn't much resources one year, and the environment does change every year, um, then what's hardwired into animals going right back to early evolution in that chain of evolution is the fact that if there's not much resources, then animals will not breed. And so that adaptive evolution being linked and sort of reacting to those environmental signals is what's hardwired. So it's actually quite hard to create inherent fertility. Now you can screw up fertility by having hormones imbalanced, but once you've got a fertile animal, her essentially her energy requirements, if met, then she will breed. And that's what we want to be aiming for. So we want to have that cow that fits the environment um, and so that Basically, we can't be like the deer populations that not all of them breed every single year if the environment's bad or if there's high numbers. You've got a population boob, so there's not as much food available. You have really hard winter. We can't do that with our cows. So we need our cows to be able to perform in the worst years. And then what we can do then is we can increase stocking rate if we need to increase production or if our management improves or if you can make, you know, through great soil management, we get more production. And then... The th key thing is don't change the cows because if you add the production per cow goes up, then when that environment changes again, climate change get, makes things harder, whatever it is, you then can't change your cows quickly. But if you've just had more cows, more smaller cows run and that extra amount of environment available, you can just sell some cows and give them a slightly easier time. So just making sure that the, the production requ maintenance requirements and the production level of those animals is actually just below what the environment uh, available energy is. And that adaptive evolution is absolutely key. And this is just to sort of highlight that. The reality is in, in, the, in nature that you don't get that every year. You don't get the same every year. And so we're adapted to that. We can't really create inherent fertility regardless of what's going on. Is that going to change through? It's gone too far. Okay. Here we go. So adaptation is not just about available energy. There's comparative anatomy that we look at at the animals as well. So even things like the attachment point of ligaments to muscles have an impact on locomotion and therefore how much an animal energy animal uses when it moves. You can sometimes see a bull, and my granddad used to have this saying that a good bull can't stand wrong. 
you know, you see the show people you know, in the ring and they'll stand it perfectly, move this foot an inch this way, that way. But the best bulls just didn't have to do that. And a good judge would always see that the great person in the show ring was, was altering and the correct animal would just be going around right. And so that's really important, important just for con conservation of energy. The other thing is that we know there's huge differences in the circulatory systems of animals as well. So in terms of what's required, that metabolic, um, that metabolic requirement that it has in any environment, if you've got a longer passageway for the arteries to get the blood to different places, then there's more energy required. Um, just in terms of how those uh, blood vessels are built can be very, very different. And so these are the kinds of things we're looking at in terms of adaptation or in terms of how efficient an animal can be. And those are the things that we're changing when we're selecting. So it's just to keep that in mind when we're looking at structure later on. So we talked about locomotion, rumen capacity, huge rumen capacity we want to look for. The vital organ capacity is huge for the metabolic rest. So we're looking for really nice wide chest on them. So they've got big heart and lung space. And you know Matthew Pinson, Steve Redgrave, the famous five gold medal rowers, they had something like double the lung capacity of the average person. And so there's huge variation within single species. And we can look at that in terms of structure and what we're selecting for as well to make sure that their environmental, they can have some more production with that environmental fit. So as I said, what this means is it's hard to breed the inherent fertility in. And would that even be desirable to get them in calf regardless of their body condition? So we must breed animals that find the energy cost of reproductive success well within the boundaries of the available environment. Seasons change, but we've got to maintain production. And the other thing to say is that if you've got that good calf that comes every year, if you need a bit more growth in a commercial system, you can maybe use a, a maternal bull on your best third maternal cows for your replacement and you can perhaps use a terminal easy calving bull then on the remaining two thirds and then you're going to get more growth and performance out of them but as long as you don't keep those heifers because then you're not changing your herd you're not making those cows bigger by selecting from the growth it's purely a terminal line that ends when you use it so how can we select for these profitable and more humane traits in cattle and I think people have talked about the I talked about the EBVs monitoring and selection and the fact that that it takes time with cattle you know that when you put the bull in you don't have a calf you know for you know you've got nine months to wait and then you've got another two years probably before you sell it before you really find out about it and then that heifer that's born and then is going to have a calf you know a couple of years later uh, and then w by the time she's then 15 you'll know a lot about her so that's a long time to really know about an animal to, s to make breeding decisions. And so Jan Bonsma, who I men mentioned earlier, wanted to speed this process up. And what if we could get take that time element and speed it up and use visual assessment to pick our, the animals that were more fertile? Uh, his background was a research background. He worked, I think it was Stellenbosch University. They had 40,000 cattle that he went through, looked at the reproductive history of every single one and looked at the structure of all the fertile cows and looked for patterns that came through when he was doing that selection. He went over to the States and they did a thousand cow assessment where he was almost, he was 100% accurate, if I can put it that way. So on 85%, so 850 of the 1,000 cows, he was able to predict how well they'd bred for how many years, even picking out the ones that have had embryo transfer without ever having seen any of those, any of those uh, cows before, just by using this system. And I think it's a numbers game, it's about observation, and observation is science. So by physical assessment, and he wanted this to be something that the practical farmer who looked at his cows or her cows every day could do in the field and pick those fertile animals because they're all adapting to that environment. Um, we've talked about a lot of the environmental pressures. And what I'll try and talk about here is we've talked a little bit before about the hormone influence on the skeletal development and the fact that they keep growing those long bones until the reproductive hormones uh, take over. You remember I said that then the growth plates on those long bones close and then the secondary sexual characteristics start to come in. Right, and that changes the development of, this of the skeleton. And that's something that we can look for when we're looking at our cows. So if you look at this, these pictures here, I hope you can all see them on the screen. So the bull at the top, or the animal at the top, was uh, castrated at six months old. 
Uh, got those long legs. The the legs just kept on growing, and then the one at the bottom, the in, the entire bull, um, is much shorter leg, you, legs. But you've got that thoracic early thoracic development that that, and it's kind of much, and it's a wedge shape from front to back. So the front's much bigger than the back of the animal. That's a, that's the masculine trait. And we look on the cows. You've got a Jersey cow there at the top, an infertile cow that's never bred. And I think, and then at the bottom, you've got you know, dairy people actually are usually quite good at picking out the fertile cows because they they know what what cows get in calf every year. And you can see the difference between these two. But when we're looking at beef animals, you know, in my head, the stuff I was taught growing up was to that real square, blocky cow that looked like she'd look good on the rails. The ones that often get selected as heifers. But actually, we want that real feminine neck. You can just see a little dip in front of the shoulder on the, the cow at the bottom and, re the, the, and the reverse wedge the other way to the bull as well, which is another thing to look for. Again, you've got the masculine versus the feminine and the highly fertile animal with much finer bone. So you can end up with, from the side, the bone can look similar, but you get much flatter bones. A meat to bone ratio is actually a really good way of looking at fertility. So that flat bone that you might look for, those in horses on a racehorse, strong flat bone is a sign of hormone balance as well. And this is one of our cows, uh, 634, so she's perhaps an Alexa. Um, but she's about as good as I've managed to breed so far. She's a favourite, and she's actually on my shirt here today. You've been watching her around grounds for the last couple of days. You can see she's got a really tidy udder, which seems to go with fer fertility, I find. Um, that symmetrical, everything's being symmetrical is, is often and that. And that also, um, in terms of being quite pretty, I, I went to buy a load of heifers off uh, a lady in Cheshire, and she selected her heifers when I went up there. And I thought I haven't been looking into this. And she said, oh, I just pick the heifers, whichever I think are the prettiest heifers. That's how I select them. And I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> and uh, so I go and have a look. And I thought they looked look nice heifers. And out of when we started out, I went to the top Aberdeen Angus Hers, the one with all the numbers, telling you they, they're going to do amazing things. Out of all the cows I bought, all the heifers I bought, out of this herd, about 85% of all the females were really fertile, worked really well. And if I say that, out of the top, top herds that I used in grass-fed systems, that high-energy animals, high-growth animals, I'm left with one, you know, I'd buy 15 heifers, I can think of one, I bought 15 heifers, I've got one of those left is still in production, and that's probably going this year, whereas those worked. And actually, when we think about beauty, it tends to be about symmetry, and then you think about the other, other uh, alignment and correct other, that's also about symmetry. You can probably just make out maybe that between her front legs, despite having a narrow shoulder, she's really wide between her front legs. So, she, so she's got vital or organ capacity as well. You've got a feminine shoulder. And the reason why that's important, the way you can see that, what they call a U neck, the little U in front of the shoulder there, is because the chine bones on top of the spine, if you've got a high growth rate, they just keep growing because of that growth hormone. And they'll top over the uh, the shoulder blade so that when it walks the cow the shoulder blade will not rotate above that ch the top of the chine bone so you won't see it rotate above so if you just go when you go home today go and look at your cows see if you can see that shoulder as she walks rotating above the chine bone and you see th and see how those have bred and it's not like every single thing works with this I've got some cows that don't fit this type that breed every year but I find that they don't self replace. So maybe 30 to 40% of their heifers actually work. Whereas the cows that are structured like this, you'll find sort of 80 to 90% of their heifers will work. So you can have these outliers that might be really growthy and fertile, but they won't self-replace in your system. And they can fool you if you're not careful. If you look at the hip slope we've got there, um, so from the hook to the pin, so the hip down to the pin bone round by the tail, you want a nice slope. So when the calf is coming out of there, it's coming downhill. And that that's down to, again, if those long bones keep growing, then that pin bone is pushed up, and then the birth canal is actually going uphill. And so you hear of problems where, you know, if there is a problem carving and if there's some bleeding inside, actually all of that blood will not drain. Uh, it'll just run back inside, and it can cause infection and problems, where if, if it's the other way, then it will drain, and that's a natural animal. If you look at wild mammals as well, you'll see that hip slope is even more exaggerated than that. And those that have horses will see that 
you know, there's a really exaggerated hip slope in horses and there tends not to be a problem of foaling within horses on the whole unless they've been bred too extreme. So as you can see her, and she's got a good back end and she produces some of the most masculine bull calves that we ever produce, even though she looks so feminine. Um, and that was taken, the tidy teats on the other, and that was taken the day of calving. So, uh, you know, that's what we want to look for. And there's just an il illustration of those chine bones above the shoulder blade growing taller where there's the growth hormone and then shorter where you can see that shoulder blade is going to rotate above. You can also see how the shoulder angle is changed by the growth of those long bones as well. And it's interesting as well that, you know, that's something my granddad always said that foot problems are always structure problems. If you have that uh, shoulder angle correct, that means that you'll end up with the set of the claws, the foot the hoof is set at the right angle. You've got equal pressure on the clee all the way round when it's on level ground, and so therefore you don't get that those as many problems from the feet. Because nearly always, if that toe's turned up, you get hoof growth. If it's if it's too straight and it's over the top, then they're going to get pressure on the toe, and you're more likely to get cracking and infection. Um, and so that is really important when we look at structure. And also just talking about that fine bone. So that it what. You can see the fertile versus the subfertile, but the key thing is the thickness of that. So, it's some t so you've got the flat bone, so it's fine when you look from the front. Front. Thank you very much. And I'll just go through some pictures now, just to help people get their eyes in, so that when you go back home, you can have a look at the cows and selecting. You can see the type we're looking for. Often, it's not that kind of real carcass trait type of, type of cow we're looking at. It's really feminine front end. You can see the web wedge shape on here. Now you might say there's a bit a few lumps in the back. You could definitely see that shoulder and the little and the little U neck right in front of the shoulder. Um, and you can see that. And it's interesting when we think about people breeding for top line, is one of the things that happened with fertile cows is we've ended up with high tails dealing breeding for top line because that hip slope can still be there with a um, with that. But if you think about what the show ring can sometimes do, trying to get that level top line, bring that pin bone up, and we then haven't got the hip slope we need for proper draining of, the, uh, of, of, the, of that area of the vagina. You can see here again the reduced pelvic opening. So it's really interesting how the femur length can push up that pin bone because you've got that growth rate on the long bone, and that means there's less room. Now, a lot of selection on the pelvic measurements that we have within cattle, particularly on the celeds, is actually looking at the how big the pelvic area is. So they measure the inside and then select the biggest ones. The problem with that is, if you look what's happened to celer cattle, is those cattle have just got bigger and bigger and bigger as those pelvic openings have got bigger. We perhaps didn't need to look at the size of the pelvic opening. We needed to look at actually look more at the structure of the pelvis itself and then you're going to have that easy carving situation. But those long bone structure has a huge impact on pelvic structure as well. So it's another one of our cows uh, just after carving, Tidy Erda. She's in good body condition. You've got the pelvic hip slope and you've got that feminine shoulder. Uh, here's another one of our cows. That's uh, uh, Mini Quick. Lovely broad mus muzzle, uh, Tidy, tidy Udder. She's got a nice slope on her, on her hip as well, produces a knife. She's probably one of our biggest cows. And so my dad absolutely loves this cow because he's, she's like, she performs in your system. She's massive, produces a big calf every year. We want 100 like her. The problem is, she if I breed her to, the, to a like-sized bull, then her heifers, maybe about 20, 30% of them will work. Whereas if I get her sort of her fertility and her ability to produce at that level and then maybe put a more moderating bull in so that her heifers will be smaller have a lower um, energy requirement then actually that then she can stay in the herd I'm not going to select her out on size but I'm just going to always breed back to the middle to the optimum not to the maximum something else you'll see with uh, we talked about the developer the secondary uh, sexual characteristics if they don't happen in time before they carve then you don't actually have the development of things like the escutcheon. So you can see the picture on the left there is that wide, velvety udder material with the real soft hairs on that you, you have on the udder. And then at carving time, when the, uh, when the vulva swells and everything gets loose, then that whole area you know, becomes very flexible and it makes carving ease you know, much simpler. 
is also a sign of, of high butter fat, interestingly enough. Um, and, so, and high butter fat rather than milk volume can be really helpful for your calves in terms of energy. If you look at the one on the right where that escutcheon is almost coming to nothing but up to the volvo, so you've got that hide of the cow rather than the velvety material, and that's not going to be as flexible, it's not going to swell up, and it can lead to problems of, of, of a tight vulva at calving, you know, with a head out, nothing else comes, and, um, and calving problems. So again, not allowing the proper time for the development of the secondary sexual characteristics before the animal calves has a big impact on that fertility long term. There's a heifer up on the hill, um, roughing it. She's, she's got some grass there, but she's got to find her way around. Uh, it goes up to 900 feet. There's a group of heifers on the Welsh borders. Geraint Powell's got those, are, those are bred with our genetics. Uh, he's doing a fantastic job up there. Another thing you might see is, this, can you see the folds on the front of the cow there? Just coming down to the brisket. Um, so that's another little sign of fertility as well. And these tiny little, li little traits. Now I can't say exactly why all of these th things are happening, but it's something in that 40,000 cow assessment, this is something that came time and time again, and it's definitely something I notice. When they're in bod good body condition, the best, most fertile cows have this little, little thing on the front of them like that, those little pleats. Again, just a really good example of the shoulder, the shoulder dip if it's not there, as we go through, and just to get your eye in as we go through. You can have some quite nice, productive, decent back end. You've got that wedge shape. Again, that feminine shoulder is what we're looking for. This is uh, on the farm of a guy called Darius Meitler in the States who's been breeding, line breeding cows for fertility, and his father did for many, many years, about 40, 50 years now, with Jan Bonsma's help. As we go through. So it's not all Angus or Black Boldies. There's some nice Herefords too. Uh, this is also on their farm. Again, that feminine cow, tidy udder, feminine shoulder. And I'll finish on uh, the story of Old Granny, who is the first cow in the Aberdeen Angus herd book. And I think I'm right in saying that was 1856. Now, she calved at two years old, and then she had a calf every year until she was 27. And they loved her so much, they kept her alive until she was 33. By the look of the picture, it looks like maybe they should have culled her a bit earlier. But if that's the first cow in the herd book in 1856, and she did that in terms of fertility and production, I mean, how much does she owe anyone if she produced that many calves? How far have we come in all our cleverness and science since the first cow in the Angus herd book? Or have we actually gone backwards? And I think just to finish to say that the opportunity we have to have fertile cows that are really productive and also really good for welfare, we've got to look after these animals. It's never been more important for us to have positive messages around what we're doing with our animals that fit our environment and allow us to produce really good beef whilst also helping the environment. It's never been more important. And I hope we can fit that. If we can do that just in a small way for our cows, and hopefully we'll have done something positive. So thank you very much. And just to say, fepsandangus.com, you can sign up to our newsletter and follow what we do and uh, come and see us if you like. Any questions? I think we've got time for a couple. There's a question over there. I think there's a roving mic coming at some point. Yeah. Well, there's another one here. It should, it should so just come on. Uh, yeah. wh when you were talking about um, looking at hormone balance, I mean, presumably you're not actually talking about testing for this. You're talking about it, looking at it being expressed more. Yeah. So what are you actually looking for there? So I think in terms of selection is actually to keep it really simple and beautiful. It, uh, although we're looking at visual assessment, the beautiful is as beautiful does. So I, I've got some cows that do not fit the visual assessment and they stay because they breed every year, but they don't reliably replace themselves. So in terms of the bulls I'm selecting and then in terms of the heifers I'm selecting going forward, I'm trying. I'm just basically breeding. That's where I do the visual assessment on them. So just you don't actually do have to do anything much more complicated and what than just have all the, f the fertile cows, first, second cycle breeders, and eventually you'll end up with feminine-looking cows if you don't do that. 
Um, yes. Uh, you say you're breeding um, calves at two. Assessing carving at two. Carving at two. Yes, that's what I meant. Yeah. If if how do you assess whether that cow, cow young heifer is strong enough to take a bull? So and, and you you can adjust at either end. Obviously, you can adjust the bull, or you, I mean, how well fed is she? If she's only on grass. Yeah. Strength of her vis a vis a bull coming at her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> People talk about. Um, uh, having a certain set of weight before you get to b before you bull them, um, but we actually just bull everything. So we bull all our heifers, and it's easy to look at them and decide what you think are, th are the best ones. I can have some of the smallest heifers we bull; they'll get in calf, and they just put on this incredible development and become really cowy uh, by the time they come to calf, even though they're smaller. And so I just let selection do that, and we haven't had a problem with it. So we've never had calving difficulty. I think the other thing to say is this is the hip slope is really the what's the one thing I'd say on structure that you really if you really look at if you've got that right then I I tend ne to never have God, God willing I don't tend never to have problems with the carving so I think ju I just put everything to the to the bull and then in terms of selection when they've got in calf and they've had a calf correctly um, and then they've got in calf again I'm a much better judge of an animal. So you're not worried about the weight of the bull relative to the young heifer. Well, you could get you can use young bulls, and I know people also. Um, you can run the you can actually run the bull calves with them as well from your own herd for the first time, so they can have the same age. You know, if you've got 13 month old heifers to the bull with 13 month old bulls, I visited a guy in Argentina, um, Alberto Areco, who had a thousand heifers to the bull, um, and he would put a hundred bull calves. He'd take a thousand bull calves, semen test them, take the top uh, top twenty percent in terms of fertility, and he'd put the uh, and he'd put a hundred bulls in with a thousand heifers, and then he'd find that about twenty eighty percent of the calves would come from twenty percent of the bulls, and then that's how he selected his bulls going forward. But again, he uh, he had to find out about the heifers by just putting them to the bull. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you very much. Safe journeys home.